It's spring in the year 1799, Boston, Massachusetts. Francis Cabot Lowell, an energetic 24-year-old, darts through the busy Long Wharf on his way to his office. Already, Lowell is an enterprising merchant. Three years earlier, he'd returned to Boston from a post-Harvard European tour and set up shop. His time in Europe enabled him to develop relationships with both suppliers and buyers. He was now importing silks and tea from China and hand-spun, hand-woven cotton textiles from India. Mr. Lowell, when you said you had a modest office, you did not exaggerate. Mr. Dalrymple, how very good to see you once again. My office is indeed not as well appointed as I recall yours is. Perhaps one day, young man. <laughs> the tall and distinguished Lawrence Dalrymple was a merchant from Liverpool, England. He and Lowell had done no business yet, but their active correspondence pointed to that possibility. Thank you again, Mr. Dalrymple, for sending on that assortment of cotton textiles. Do you believe you may find buyers for them? I've shown them to various shop owners in Boston, and if we can come to a satisfactory pricing arrangement, I do believe we can develop a market for them here. We've done well, of course, with the Indian calicos, but we've not yet done anything with the finished textiles, let alone raw and undyed. Mr. Lowe, you and your fellow merchants here do always worry so very much about pricing, but I need only look around at the state of dress in Boston to know that finer clothing would be distinctive and improving. Construction of proper clothing is more than just color. Have you given any more thought to the idea of a more reciprocal arrangement? Oh, I've spent days of my time here on nothing else. Days, Mr. Dalrymple? I should be flattered. My dear Mr. Lowell, as you well know, I'm a merchant of only the finest quality goods. Insistent, I've heard people say. That's the least I've heard. Insistent on quality, down to the last detail. The last thread. The last drop. Drop? Yes, drop, Mr. Lowell. I could find no products of sufficient quality to impress my buyers in Britain, save one. It is rum, Mr. Lowell. I'm Kevin Kimley, and you're listening to the Entrepreneur's Ethic Podcast. Today, we're diving into Francis Cabot Lowell's early years. In my upcoming book, we'll learn about Lowell's audacious plan to manufacture clothing of his own in America, rather than export cotton and re-import it as finished textiles. In doing so, he revolutionized something that hardly existed at the time, American manufacturing, and began to dismantle preconceptions of the country's role in the world. But before he ever did that, he created his own rum distillery, despite not particularly caring for the spirit. The pubs in Liverpool have created a good demand for rum. I find it rather vile, but sailors to the Americas apparently pick up a taste for it. When they're on shore, they're creating a sizable purchase. Poor devils. At any rate, with all the ships that pass through Boston from the Caribbean, my thought is that you could procure rum, quality rum, of course, and that can be the basis for reciprocal trade that you so much insist upon. There are nearly 40 rum houses here in Boston, Mr. Dalrymple. I believe I can get you more consistent supplies at a better price. Less shipping, less expense, you see. There's so much more to it than just economizing on shipping, Mr. Lowell. I hate to repeat myself, but quality is the key. Quality, quality, quality. Again, I find rum quite poor. But if one must have it, I find the Caribbean rum superior. It's simply too difficult to produce anything of quality in America. I hope I haven't offended you, Mr. Lowell. Not at all. At the turn of the 19th century, America was still an early adolescent. At the 1800 census, its population was around 5.3 million, nearly 900,000 of whom were enslaved. The Northwest Territory, which would become, in time, America's manufacturing heartland, was still sparsely populated and largely agricultural. The United States was in the habit of exporting raw commodities and importing finished goods. While we've experienced our fair share of supply chain disruption lately, at least we aren't sending it over the ocean hoping for favorable winds. We next meet Francis Cabot Lowell four years later in 1803. For $6,700, he purchased a distillery on the corner of George and Belknap Streets in Boston. 
The property had once belonged to the loyalist Richard Leshmere, who fled to Halifax, Canada, as Boston erupted against the crown. The Leshmeres eventually returned to England, and their property was confiscated. There were plenty of naysayers in Lowell's life. Good lord, Francis, what do you know of making rum? You don't even drink it. There are almost 50 other rum distilleries in Boston. There's no hope of making money. You buy rum cheap and sell it at a markup, Francis. Why on earth try to make your own? Indeed, he had accumulated what money he had as a merchant. He had a significant business as an importer of wine, brandy, whiskey, and gin from Europe. He also bought rum from Boston and the Caribbean and shipped it back to Europe. He learned over the years how to make money with products shipped between Boston and Europe. Aside from spirits, he shipped American cotton to British textile mills and imported cotton textiles from those same mills. So Lowell surely understood why the foray into rum manufacture seemed odd to family, friends, and associates. There was risk from all sides. Could he make rum others would buy? Would he be distracted from merchant activities where he made money? Could the money he had tied up be turned around for profit more efficiently in other investments? Good questions all. Back in the office. Charles, what brings you in this fine evening? I remembered the books I'd purchased for you. Ah, outstanding. Thank you, brother. Hold your judgment, Francis, until you see if there's anything useful in them. I can't decipher much. What do you think books on distilling Scottish whiskey can teach you? I'm so new to distilling that I don't know what I don't know. But you've been at it for what? Three years? I think you'd fully be versed in distilling by now. Why would you want to be distilling and selling spirits at all, is my question. I know you don't approve of spirit, Charles. But I've always viewed that the problem with spirits is the people who drink too much, not with the drink itself. Indeed, Francis. There are surface issues like public drunkenness. It's gotten so much worse. But there are the deeper issues in homes. Wrecked families, wives and their children living in fear of the men who should be their protectors. I don't wish to be in the distilling business forever, but it's been such rewarding learning. Learning, Francis. I bring you books about distilling, so I can imagine learning can occur with your comprehension of them. But look at you. Your clothes are stained and there's sweat on your brow. I've learned from books, Charles, but I learn too with my hands. How to heat this pot properly, for example. It's my second. The first was larger, about 600 gallons, but I couldn't control the temperature properly. It burst over so frequently that I wasted more than I produced. This one appears smaller. I thought you only did bigger. That's the idea. This one is about half the size of the first, 300 gallons, but it's much sturdier for the pressure produced by the steam. My real work has been on the seal at the top, but the best source of improvement has been this small and delicate instrument. This is a thermometer. I purchased it from John Lucas of Liverpool. It tells the temperature. The red line in the tube goes up to 79 degrees. That's the temperature of the air? Exactly. How is it useful? Oh, it's not, but I immerse it in the fluid to know its temperature. You see, alcohol from the mash turns to steam at a lower temperature than water. If I can hold my heat steady and keep the temperature of the mash between 178 and 182 degrees, I get the most efficient and consistent production. So, boiling from a pot half the size still yields as well as one twice its capacity. See here. You've always favored calculations in your studies, Francis. I think we'll be able to double production using almost the same amount of molasses, fuel, and labor. I think you've gone mad. Are those lemons? Yes, we found that they give the rum a pleasant taste and fragrance. So, quality and quantity? Are you sure you can do both? Aren't you a merchant? Not a manufactory operator. Perhaps Lowell had gone mad. We laugh now, but the instruments that he implemented, thermometers, hydrometers for measuring alcohol levels, even something as simple as creating a well-honed set of processes were novel ideas at the time. Lowell did indeed turn to Scottish whiskey distillation for inspiration, but rum is not whiskey, and he had to figure out the difference between the two spirits. Where whiskey is distilled from grains, rye and corn for example, rum starts with molasses. He had purchased a boiling pot patented by Alexander Anderson, but it had boiled over and wasted material. Back to Boston. 
Isaac Davis, welcome. I seem to be attracting company this evening. Francis, I'm glad to find you so very late in the day. And Charles, good to see you too. I've heard you made your return from England. I'll cut to the point, Francis. I know you're making a go of this rum business, but I wanted to discuss if you'd considered either moving it to a new building or just taking the profits from the sale of the property. It seems you must have a business idea for me, Isaac. I always listen. You do listen, Francis. I'll give you that. Your actual agreement with my ideas is infrequent, however. I know you're developing properties on Chamber Street and have your eye on this neighborhood, Isaac, but this building works well for this business. I know, I know, Francis. Just hear me out. You know how properties in Boston can work. A single lot can be worth one thing, but if there's a plan for contiguous lots, even whole streets or neighborhoods, then the value of the property and the structures affixed to it can increase more substantially. Isaac, I just don't have interest. If you are not indeed interested, I'll bother you no further, but $12,000, Francis. I'll pay you that amount for this building and property. That'll provide plenty of funds for another property and buildings. I know you only make the most considered decisions. Take whatever time you need. Perhaps next week we can visit again. Uh, next week, Isaac. Very well. You have given me something to consider. Francis, I knew you made much money, but I never witnessed just how that happens. How did you find it? Interesting, I suppose. I mean, I have no talent or desire for it, but it's like watching people dance. You and Isaac swaying to the music of money and transaction, trying not to step on one another's feet. What did you buy this for, Francis? The building and property, I mean. $6,700. $5,000 in profit. A sum most people can't even fathom. I understand, Charles. Indeed, it's much money. Yet I don't know that I should accept Isaac's offer. What, Francis? I know I'm not a trader, but Isaac just offered you a 70% gain on your purchase. How could you turn down such an amount? A 79% increase, to be exact. Even accounting for time, not bad. Accounting for time? Yes, Charles. It took four years to yield the gain, so one must account for the time value of the money. If I'd put the $6,700 into another purpose, it may have yielded a return. Considering I've had the $6,700 I paid for this building tied up for four years, if I take the $12,000 offer, offer from Isaac, it will have an annualized return of uh, just under 16%. Indeed, Charles, that is quite a good rate of return on investment. If a return such as that is sustained, one can double their investment in four to five years. I've always thought my memory for verse and scripture was a power of mind for others to envy, but your power of mind for money and calculations is something altogether particular to you. It suggests to me that your type of thinking could conclude to take Isaac's offer. Perhaps, but there are other considerations. Ah, yes, such as taking one rum maker out of business for the public's good. Perhaps I've had an influence on you after all. Charles... When you get set up in your ministry, you know I'll help support your work. If temperance is part of that work, then good for you, and good for those you can help. I do appreciate the sentiment, Francis, but isn't there an incoherence if you produce and profit from rum and then support temperance? There's hardly a product of human consumption I can think of where it cannot be misused in some way, or there's some injustice involved with this production or distribution, even food. Food is, of course, necessary for our living, but too much or too much of the wrong food can lead to ill health. Francis, you're surely not calling stoutness of frame an injustice. Do you still take sugar in your tea? Indeed. Have you thought of where your sugar in your tea comes from? From you, brother. Isn't it one of your most traded items? Indeed. But that sugar, whether here in Boston or what you have in your English afternoon teas, comes from the Caribbean islands where sugar cane is produced. I've not visited myself, but understand the indescribable horrors faced by enslaved people who provide the labor. So if you ought to give up rum making, then I ought to give up sugar in my tea? I don't know, Charles. I only bring it up to reflect the complex moral dimensions of, well, everything. I do want to leave the world a better place than I've found it. But I believe I must choose my battles. And you, of course, must choose yours. I have some skills for business and money. For a time, rum's been part of it. Hopefully the world is at least no worse off for it. And there's some chance I can use what's come from rum making for good. I can't help but be a skeptic, Francis, that any good can arise from rum-making, but I am curious. 
at the most basic level is the profit. A 16% annualized rate of return from Isaac offer is indeed good, but I've exceeded that with the profits. The first year's profits were about $1,000, but I've been able to increase by $2,000 per year since then. This year, I believe the business will profit about $7,000, so the business will have thrown off more than $15,000 in profits, an annualized return exceeding 30%. The business may soon profit as much in one year as Isaac is offering? Yes, you've got the idea. Are you investing those profits back into the rum business? Only a fraction. The improvements in the distilling process do come from purchased improvements, but mainly from improvements arising from, well, me. The yield of rum from every gallon of molasses we purchase has increased several fold. The quality of the product has improved such that I can charge higher prices and the expense per gallon produced has been reduced. Do you invest the profits in something else or simply gather your money into ever higher piles? I've invested in improvements to our wharf facility, which results in more profitable merchant business. We can store more products in good quality for both import and export, and our labor expense per ton shipped has been lowered. And like Isaac, I've too been buying some properties around Boston, just more quietly than he. I've always known that you would be rich someday, but I believe I now understand that you are already quite there. Yet I look at you in your soiled shirt and dirty hands working into the night. This isn't the picture of the wealthy Francis Lowell I've envisioned. I suppose I am a strange creature, but I can't explain how much pleasure I've gotten from working here on all these improvements. Developing my abilities as a merchant has been good. I supply products people want to buy with efficiency. There's no simple formula for putting coffee, sugar, tea, wine, brandy, and cloth in the right place, at the right time, for the right price. But to make something. Rum is such a crude spirit when in comparison to the Scottish whiskies written about in this book. Yet the rum I now produce is as good, perhaps better, than anything others make. I've probably never shared how it all started. I don't believe I know how you got started, Francis. I was just starting my studies at Harvard, not really paying attention, I suppose. Two events, I suppose, turned my attention to rum making. The first was that I have developed a trading relationship with a merchant in Liverpool. Isaac Davis is his name. I've done a good business with him in rum, but he had expressed doubts as to whether anyone in Boston could make even a decent rum. I'd gotten in two casks of rum from a regular maker here in Boston. I was just developing buying relationships in England. The seaport towns where sailors settle seemed to have a demand for it. Anyway... One of the cask of rum, upon my sampling it, was of similar taste and quality to the past shipments, but the other was simply bad. Something had went wrong in the distilling, I suppose. I wouldn't ship it to my new customers in England, so I requested a refund. Did he refund your money? He did, but not without significant complaint. As the conversation ended, he looks at me. Young low, if you're so smart, make your own damned rum. I've gotten more out of alcohol than alcohol has gotten out of me, said the great British Prime Minister, Winston Churchill. I'm not sure the same can be said by the United States of America. America and alcohol, it's complicated. Early Americans imported their drinking habits based on the cultural norms of the countries from which immigrants came, predominantly Northern and Central Europe. W.J. Rohrabaugh wrote in his research on American alcohol consumption for the OAH Magazine of History, quote, By 1770, Americans consumed alcohol routinely with every meal. Many people began the day with an eye-opener and closed it with a nightcap. People of all ages drank, including toddlers, who finished off the heavily sugared portion at the bottom of a parent's mug of rum toddy, end quote. At least there weren't cars. By the time Francis Cabot Lowell was developing his rum distillery, a number of factors were driving an even bigger expansion of alcohol consumption. Most importantly, growth in the cultivation of high-yielding corn in the developing interior led to the conversion of the crop into whiskey. It's cheaper to transport whiskey than corn. Practical economics were at work. Rohrabaugh notes that by the 1820s, whiskey sold for 25 cents a gallon, making it cheaper than beer, wine, coffee, tea, or milk. An English traveler, Frederick Marriott's A Diary in America, published in 1837, the writer remarks that the Americans drank for every conceivable occasion. 
Quote, I'm sure the Americans can fix nothing without a drink. If you meet, you drink. If you part, you drink. If you make an acquaintance, you drink. If you close a bargain, you drink. They quarrel in their drink. They make it up with a drink. They drink because it is hot. They drink because it is cold. If successful in elections, they drink and rejoice. If not, they drink and swear. They begin to drink early in the morning. They leave off late at night. They commence it early in life. They continue it until they soon drop into the grave. End quote. On a per capita basis, by 1830, Americans were drinking the equivalent of three to four times the amount Americans do today. It's natural that into this culture, an opposing force would arise, temperance. Charles Lowell was indeed emblematic of one of the sources of this movement, churches. Churches in early America started schools, hospitals, orphanages, and eventually became key parts of reform movements that included abolition of ills such as slavery and alcohol. When I was in grade school on a farm my family owns, I was helping my dad and granddad carry potatoes up the stairs of what we called a cave. Others might refer to it as a root cellar. It was an in-ground cellar used as both a shelter from tornadoes and to store potatoes, root vegetables, and other preserves. They were common in the era before basements. On a wooden table in the cave was a dusty collection of bottles and other glassware. What's that? I asked my dad. Prohibition, Kevin, he said. Your great-grandfather liked beer. In my German heritage family, fondness for beer is not novel. I did some research on prohibition and learned what a crimp it had put on my beer-loving ancestors and others. If you can't buy it, brew it, was apparently the answer for this quandary. My grandmother remembered carrying beer up and down those same stairs for her dad when she was young. Prohibition in the United States was a constitutional ban on the production, importation, transportation, and sale of alcoholic beverages from 1920 to 1933. But the thing was that prohibition didn't really work. There was some evidence that alcohol consumption did go down somewhat, but whatever social ills were cured were offset by a whole bunch of other problems. Prohibition is a great study in what sweeping new laws most surely invoke, the law of unintended consequences. People who heretofore did not find drinking alcohol interesting found it as such when it was illegal. If you've learned much about speakeasies, bootleggers, moonshiners, Al Capone, or our very own Templeton Rye from Iowa, then you've learned about how prohibition didn't work at all. But Francis Cabot Lowell's development of a rum business in Boston in the early 19th century did work. And it worked in more than just a business sense. Lowell did not sell his distillery to Isaac Davis in 1803. He continued to develop the rum business alongside his merchant business. But after several more years, it had lost its purpose for Lowell. Part of it was that the market for rum wilted under the developing market for increasingly cheap American-made whiskey. But the larger issue was that Lowell had gotten out of the business what he wanted. While it did prove profitable from a financial perspective, the real profit was in the learning that Lowell, the entrepreneur, had gained. I recently listened to a podcast featuring Elon Musk talking about Tesla. He remarked that one of his significant learnings in scaling that business is how much more complex it is to scale a manufacturing business versus making a prototype. I'm paraphrasing a bit here, but his remarks was something like, it's easy to make a prototype, but it's a wicked hard problem to scale manufacturing of a product so that it's efficient and consistent in quality. Lowell was one of the pioneering American entrepreneurs to work on that same problem. In the dialogue with his brother Charles, the younger brother made the observation that his brother, that wasn't even close to 30 years old, was quite wealthy. And indeed, that was the case. And 10 years later, it was even further the case. Lowell's merchant business had continued to grow in profit. The cultural norm of the day would have been for Lowell to have retired to the life of a country gentleman while in his 30s or 40s. This was in copying, at least to a certain extent, the model of British aristocracy. But Lowell didn't aspire to that kind of aristocracy. He was fascinated by ideas that he could take his mathematical insights about weaving and build them into a scalable manufacturing business. Rum wasn't to be that end goal business but it was the proving ground for one of the most brilliant minds and impactful entrepreneurs in American history. You see, Francis Cabot Lowell is recognized as one of the significant founders of American manufacturing. He went on to apply what he'd learned in his rum business to textile manufacturing in the decade following his work on distilling. 
Historians trace the roots of what is now called the Industrial Revolution primarily to development of the textile industry, starting in Great Britain and later to the United States, with Francis Cabot Lowell as a central character in the early industrialization of the country. It was the beginning of what economic historian Deidre McCloskey calls the Great Enrichment, the centuries-long economic takeoff that lifted global living standards starting in the late 1700s. Great Britain's industrial might emerged when machinery for spinning cotton replaced hand spinning that was done in the homes before the mid-1700s, and eventually power looms were developed to weave finished textiles. Francis Cabot Lowell gave up his rum business and took his family in 1811 on an extended visit to Great Britain. It wasn't all rest and relaxation for the financially successful Lowell, however. You see, he took some time to tour textile mills, a strange thing to do on vacation even for this ever-busy historic entrepreneur. There are few modern equivalents to the founding audaciousness of Lowell's plan to launch textile manufacturing in America that arose from his visits to Scotland and England, but also from his experience in developing a rum distillery, dare we say, a rum manufacturer. When Lowell was experimenting with how to scale a rum distillery, there was virtually no American manufacturing capacity in anything. The United States was a thinly populated country along the East Coast that imported almost all finished goods. Lowell had made his fortune, after all, as a merchant who understood in precise detail what the United States could export and what it had to import. Export commodities, the British told him, and others, and import value-added manufactured goods produced by us. You Americans focus on low-profit commodities, and we British will hoard the opportunities for profit in value-added manufacturing. But Lowell went on to launch Boston Manufacturing Company, a pioneering integrated cotton textile manufacturing company. Its importance is not just in the textile industry that would emerge in the expanding United States, but in providing a template for audacious launch of many, many large businesses and industries in the coming centuries. And yes, the city of Lowell, Massachusetts is named for him. Douglas Cecil North, winner of the 1993 Nobel Prize in Economics, wrote of the singular importance of Francis Cabot Lowell and the lasting impact of what he had accomplished. He'd been recognized by the American National Business Hall of Fame as one of the most important figures of American business in history, placing among the likes of such luminaries as Andrew Carnegie, Thomas Edison, and Cornelius Vanderbilt. You won't have to wait too long to dive into another case study of Francis Cabot Lowell and the founding of Boston Manufacturing Company. The rest of the story will be part of the book version of The Entrepreneur's Ethic. There are seven parts of The Entrepreneur's Ethic. Lowell's work exemplifies Ethic 1, Make Things Happen. This is the action orientation of entrepreneurship. In Francis Cabot Lowell's list of actions that dented the universe is long. Develop American manufacturing capacity. Dive deep into technical details. Create structures that finance scale. Attract talent from wherever it comes. Enable new markets. Where there's a task that no one else knows how to do, do it yourself. Ethic 1 make things happen. There are calls today for Americans to get busy building. Notable entrepreneur, investor, and venture capitalist Mark Andreessen, for instance, posted an article in 2020 at the height of the COVID pandemic entitled, It's Time to Build. I very much agree with the central idea of that article, but I also take inspiration from entrepreneurial builders from history such as Francis Cabot Lowell. Getting mojo for building in America doesn't have to be invented from scratch. We just need to remember who we are and from whom we came. Rome is an important precursor to one form of building in America, manufacturing. You can drink to that. <laughs> <laughs>